The second speaker needs no introduction as far as I'm concerned. He was the deputy leader for the SNP for many years and is a die-hard independence activist. Lady and ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Jim Sellers. I've been uh, on a lot of platforms during the referendum. And what Lindsay said about the politicos <coughs> is not new to me. I am not a politician. I have heard working class people say throughout the length and breadth of this country. That's the problem with the working class. If the working class in Scotland are prepared to say there are politicians and then there are us. They stand for Parliament, we don't. Then we'll get Parliaments full of the suits for years to come of people with no experience of life when in fact what we require are the lenses of this world into the Parliament. <laughs> I'm not saying that in any flattering way, by the way. I was at Shots last week in an election campaign, and there was a local activist got up, and she made the best speech, and she was more authentic than anybody else. And I've written to her and said, you have to think of standing for Parliament because you've got all the experience in the world. You take Kezi Dugdale who sits on the front bench for Labour in the Scottish Parliament. Now she's a nice lassie. University student politics, research for Lord Fuchs as an MSP and is now an MSP. Compare her world experience with Lindsay's. There is no comparison whatsoever. And working class people throughout the length and breadth of Scotland have got to do what I did because I left Air Academy with not a single certificate to my name, with a rector telling me I'd never make anything of myself in this world. I had the gall to say I was as good as anybody educated at Fetty's, Eton or Oxford. We've got to have the same self-confidence in the working class. Otherwise, we'll be led by the nose for generations to come. Well, Lindsay pointed out that knowledge is power. If you don't have knowledge, you don't have power. It's been part of the British and the Labour establishment since John Smith died. If anybody wants to know why the Labour Party started dying, it was the day that John Smith disappeared. They have kept us in ignorance of fundamental issues and therefore have been able to do what they like with us. In the past, the Labour Party just weighed the votes in Scotland and sent down a tribute to Westminster. RIC, and the reason I'm here this afternoon, I think it's a great organisation, because it's not involved in propaganda, it's involved in political education, to give the working class people knowledge so that they use that knowledge to gain power. Now, we have to set, when we are talking about Scotland's future, we have to understand it in two historic con contexts. From about 1650 right up to about 50 years ago, the world was dominated economically, politically and militarily by what you would call the Atlantic Access, the eastern seaboard of the United States and Europe. In fact, when I was a wee boy, if you wanted to say something was really bad, you said it was in a worse case than China. And of course, it was true at that time. The West dominated. That began to change substantially about 50 years ago. The next 100, 200 years, the world is going to be dominated by the Asia-Pacific axis. That's what going to happen and it's happening now. Where do we fit our five million people 
into that new world? That's a question for the left to examine with intellectual rigor. The other historic context is the United Kingdom. During the referendum, they told us Scotland has to get the power and the strength of the UK around it. £1.5 trillion pounds worth of debt. The debt has doubled in the last five years. Private debt, that's credit cards and mortgages, is £1.4 trillion. Pounds. The Bank of England has started printing money. Do you know how quantitative easing works? The government need to borrow, let's say, £10 billion. They issue a bond and a bank buys it. And the government then has to pay interest to the bank. But the theory is the bank, that 10 billion's away, so they've made money to lend to business. So the Bank of England prints money electronically and buys the bond back from the bank, leaving the bank with 10 billion to actually so-called invest in business. You then have a government institution, the Bank of England, owning its own government's debt, and its own government pays interest to the Bank of England. At the moment, the Bank of England holds £375 billion worth of its own government debt. The government has paid interest, and last year the interest came to a total of £35 billion and George Osborne said to the Bank of England, I'll have that money back. That's funny money they're talking about. And when a state has to engage in funny money, there is no inherent strength in it whatsoever. And if Scotland remains handcuffed to that declining state, because you're talking about the end of the English-British Empire, every empire, has gone up, started to decline, and then fell. Whether in antiquity you're talking about the Persian Empire, Alexander the Great's Empire, the Romans, the Spanish, the Portuguese, why should the English-British Empire be any different? We're now in the final stages of decline. The Daily Telegraph, which is the Tory graph, has a campaign about spending more money on defence. And in its leader column and in its columnists, they talk about the UK still being a world power. Well, the former chief of the general staff of the British Army, in this campaign, wrote in the Telegraph what the reality is. A surface fleet of 19 vessels only frigates and destroyers. Uh, they can only have an army that can put one division in the field and an air force with fewer squadrons than the fingers on two hands. That's not a great strength and power. That is an empire in its final stages of decline. We've got an aircraft carrier that can only carry helicopters. We're building another one that will only have any aircraft on it. They couldn't defend the Isle of Wight, the Royal Navy, at the present time. I was in the Navy for five and a half years. When I left the Navy in 1960, we had a home fleet, a Mediterranean fleet, a Far East fleet, and a West Indies station. You're down to 19 frigates, destroyers, and an aircraft carrier we need aircraft. That's one of the signs of serious decline. The debt is another one. But so is last week's figures, which weren't on the front pages. BBC didn't they tell you. But the balance of payments, that's the difference between what the UK earns and what it spends, is the worst in living memory in terms of GDP. That's the historical context. We have to understand the argument in respect to the future of Scotland. 
At the moment, all the talk is about full fiscal autonomy. Well, I don't ken what it means, I must tell you. The word's been bandied around, but nobody has so far defined it. If it only means that we keep the taxes that are collected in Scotland, not setting the rates, then I really want more than that. I want full economic control. And it's possible, under the present circumstances, Schedule 5 of the Act that set up the Scottish Parliament contains all the retained powers at Westminster. With the, uh, given that we're in the UK, keeping defence and foreign affairs at Westminster, I would like to see everything in Schedule 5 transferred to us. That's employment laws, and it's also control of our mineral assets in the North Sea and in the Clyde. Now, let me, I'm in North Ayrshire. Let me tell you about the Clyde. And this is where knowledge equals power and ignorance equals poverty comes in. In the 1980s, BP discovered oil in the Clyde. And at that time, me and Davy Lambie were MPs in Ayrshire. We had heard rumours, but we, were, you know, we didn't have the research facilities in the days and were brushed off. It took Chick Brodie, the SNP MP, who comes for air, to prick up his ears and go and hunt for the information. And lo and behold, Chick produces it out of the archives in the Scottish National Library. There is a BP license for oil exploration along there. What happened? 1983. A letter from the Ministry of Defence to the Department of Energy and the Scottish office saying, under no circumstances can there be any oil rigs in the Clyde, otherwise the nuclear submarine couldn't sail safely past the Ailes of Craig and out to the open sea. We were in ignorance of that. And in the meantime, our manufacturing industry was getting hammered, hammered, hammered. And there was an industry waiting to be born out there that would have transformed Ardrossan, Salkitz and Stevenson. Because at Hunterston, we've got one of the biggest natural deep water berths anywhere in the world for building rigs and all the rest of it. So we, we knew nothing about it. Well, we know about it now. And the question for the Scots is, what are you going to do about it? Now they tell us, oh, you know, if you were on your own, think of the problem, oil's down to 40 or $50 a barrel. We've got to think differently when we're talking about an independent Scotland. You know, all we get from the oil is a taxation. Unlike most countries in the world, including Norway, we don't own a single drop of the black stuff. Not a single drop. We don't have a Scottish National Oil Corporation, which would be involved in the actual production of the wealth from the North Sea. Now, I'll tell you what we can do with it. There's 400 million tonnes of oil come from the North Sea through Scotland every year. The amount we use for our domestic purposes, whether it's the trains, the lorries, or private cars, is 11 million tonnes out of 400 million. Suppose we say, well, we'll have a bit more of that, and we'll use that bit more in order to reduce the fuel level all over Scotland. Think of the difference that would make. Locally, folk would have made money in their pockets, our transport industry, those who run the trucks, would have the most fuel-efficient economy anywhere in Western Europe. Our tourist industry, at the moment, a lot of folk do not go below, above, the line between Glasgow and Edinburgh because of the cost of fuel going up into the highlands. Think what low fuel costs would mean to the tourist industry and the oil industry. There's 570 rigs in the North Sea. A number of them are 
technologically redundant. They're going to be decommissioned. That's scientific work and skilled work involved in the decommissioning. £10.3 billion pounds worth of work in the next 10 years. Where is it going to take place? It's not going to take place in North Ayrshire. One of the places it will take place is Shetland, because they are already building a facility to decommission. But what about all the others that don't go to Shetland? We all know smell them. But if we were independent, with full economic control, as, a pool, as opposed to fiscal autonomy, we can direct the work to places like this in North Ayrshire and in places in the East Coast as well. But you need the knowledge to get the power and you need to engage politically in order to make that power something in your hands. Now, there's a lot of campaigns in Scotland child poverty action, and all sorts of others, telling us about the iniquity of our society as it stands at the present time. Yes, it's dreadful. Folk can go along to the job centre and are sanctioned. That means no money. That means being destitute. Never happened in my lifetime before. But there's no point campaigning against that unless we're prepared, the working class, to take political power and end the circumstances that give rise to the food banks and the sanctions. I came into politics when I left the Navy in 1960. I came all about North Ayrshire. This was one of the great redoubts of socialism. The family that I always remember is Bob Lambie and his family left-wing socialists, same in South Ayrshire. And we had an ambition, which was to shift the balance of wealth and power to the working people and their families. We have not succeeded because we have been tied to a political and economic system south of the border, which prevents us doing what the Scottish working class have wanted to do and have the potential power to do. That's the challenge before us and the time that lies ahead. All power to what the RIC are doing, because the better educated and the better understood the circumstances by the Scottish working class, then the quicker comes the referendum. Alex Salmon said, not for a generation. I dived for the dictionary. It said 30 years. I'm 77. I can't wait that length of time. 